So over the last 15 years of teaching guitar, when I reach my final lesson with a student, generally they ask the same question. Are there any parting thoughts? Is there any parting advice that you can give me that will help me keep improving with guitar? Although I tailor that advice to each individual, today I wanted to share the general outline with you in case you wanted some direction or to be able to set some goals for yourself. And as usual, if you like this video or get anything from it, please comment, like, subscribe. It's very important to me that this channel keeps growing, so I really appreciate it. So first up of things to work on is timing. One thing I make sure to tell everyone is to keep the metronome at 60 beats per minute and practice your quarter notes, eighth notes, triplets, and sixteenths. Especially if you say the beats out loud with the metronome, it's really beneficial to be able to go one, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one. And once you get comfortable with each of those, you know, spend a lot of time doing quarters, eighths, triplets, and sixteenths, and then mix and match kind of at random. And it's really tough you'll find to go from triplets to eighths or triplets to sixteenths or back and forth. Doing that will help with your strumming as well as just recognizing those core rhythms without trying to do any kind of like crazy polyrhythms first. You really need a very strong fundamental understanding and feeling of those rhythms. After that, try playing through a song or a chord progression with the metronome on two and four. This is advice that's pretty common on any kind of practice video. And the point is, is that you stop relying so much on one and three. So in case you don't know what chord is coming next, in case you're really are relying on the one to like give you a strong idea of where the downbeat is, you won't have that security net anymore. And you'll have to create it within yourself because now two and four have all the emphasis and one is just this empty void that you have to fill. Next up would be to write out a rhythm part and write out the exact rhythms, know exactly what you're playing. Don't kind of just do it by feel, but do an exact rhythm part and work it out with the metronome at different tempos. So say I was gonna do something like, um that kind of rhythm part. Let me see if I can slow it down. So it feels quite different at that tempo, right? It feels quite, a, you know, certain notes we're realizing maybe don't need to be held out that long. Some really need to be held out more. Like let's try it as if I held out every single thing for as long as it possibly could be. might want to punctuate a little bit more and do some staccato notes. Let's try that. So there we go. Now it's feeling a lot more punctuated. It feels a little bit more fun rhythmically and I can take that back up to the original tempo. So I like the one, bah, bah, bah. I like that one at the faster tempo, but the first one I don't actually like that much. So now I have one I don't like, one I do like, but I learned something involving phrasing and lengths of notes being held out. Then I would say to do the same thing with a lick. So say my lick would be one, two, three, four. works. Why don't we do it a little fast? Now super slow. That's quite a bit tougher than you'd think. Uh, making sure to get those like you want to, you know, when you're done playing it fast and you play it slow, you want to hurry it up, you want to hurry it up, and you have to focus what is the exact rhythm, this note lands on this beat, this note lands on that beat, certain sixteenth note, let me get my words right, certain, certain sixteenth note 
uh, rhythms feel quite a bit different at 60 beats per minute versus 110 or 120. So, slow. better sense of what that lick is, what the rhythms I'm exactly trying to play are, and now I'm kind of growing in terms of being able to deliver that lick, deliver that idea, use that technique, whatever technique I decided to play the lick with at those different tempos, and I'm getting a better idea of exactly what I'm playing at any tempo. So the next area would be playing. One thing I like to recommend is playing along with backing tracks on Spotify or YouTube. Picking keys that feel comfortable, like, you know, we all like G or A or something, and picking ones that are not so comfortable, like F, F sharp, D flat, or something like that. And a lot of the ones on YouTube will have, you know, all the chords out there for you in case, you know, you want to use that. If you use the ones on Spotify, it'll be by ear that you have to go, and that'll be helpful in its own way as well. One of the things to keep in mind with backing tracks is that it's kind of like you know, putting on virtual reality goggles and being like, this is real life. Like, no, it's not. It's a simulation. It's like a, it's just a tw eight, 12, 16 bar loop kind of copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. There's no dynamics. Even if they kind of make it into a song, it's not, it's not the same as playing with people and playing like a full musical idea that is a song, but it is wonderful training ground for soloing. And the point is that you're supposed to get bored when you have the same thing happening for five and a half minutes or something like that. There's no dynamic changes, no chord, you know, big chord movements to another section or something like that. It's just a blues for five and a half minutes. You will get bored, but that's the whole point. You have to run your licks over and over, try them on different beats, try them over the different chords. You're kind of more digging. You're more doing research. You're, you know, you did some research and you're applying it in this safe area before you take it out into the real world and apply it over a real song. I'd also recommend to learn a song a week. It's usually, you know, most people can learn a kind of easy song. I'm not talking about some like 12 minute dream theater epic or anything like that. Just something kind of easily doable. You can hear it, you put it on a playlist or something like that, jam out to it over the week. And if it has some nice lead lines or a solo, try to learn that especially if you're doing stuff in the classic rock era or anything pop, generally it's not going to be some wild, you know, uh, some wild stretches or require any crazy warm ups. It'll be pretty hand friendly. It'll be pretty simple. It'll be pretty wonderful, melodic to play, wonderfully melodic to play. Also, of course, building a playlist of songs you'd want to learn. So you almost have like a set list of stuff to learn over the next like 12 weeks. If you have 12 songs, really helps you kind of understand those songs. You can put it on when you're driving somewhere or whatever, really get used to hearing them, really get used to knowing exactly what's going on after you learn them. You never listen to the song the same once you know how to play the licks or the riffs or whatever. You listen to it a little differently and having that experience is really important. Also going to a local jam is very important. A lot of people gave me pushback over the years. A lot of students were like, no, I'm too nervous or I don't want to, or it's, I'm, it's, the worst that's going to happen is some people will go, hmm, and then that'll be it. <laughs> Nothing will really go down. Um, generally, people just want to have a good time. And there's people of all, you know, uh, talent levels, skill levels, whatever, uh, experience levels at jams. If you go to like some super famous jam and some, you know, whatever, then yeah, then it might be weird. If you notice that everyone there is a virtuoso and you're not, that might be strange. If you go to a regular local, especially blues jam or something like that, I think you're going to be okay. Always worth going and always worth being able to see so many different kinds of musicians live. You're basically seeing a band and seeing everyone in it. And then that band changes. And then you see a new band, almost every song or every few songs, right? When else does that get to happen? You get to have a lot of experience analyzing people's play. And lastly, 
the one that most students actually fight me on the most is learn to sing and play. Now, I don't like singing either. Trust me, I've done it a lot. I've done it many times over the years. I've done it live, I've done it in my own room, whatever. But uh, it's helped me enormously because it makes you a bit more connected to the notes that you are playing. You know, sometimes, uh, for instance, myself, I like, I like wider interval things. And sometimes I can forget how wide those intervals are. They're not super singable. If I try to sing them, I'm always like, <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't come out so wonderfully. And if I try to sing something, it'll come out obviously a bit more linear, linearly. not singing <laughs> that's not that's not happening and it's kind of nice to be able to go okay if I want to play a solo that might connect a little bit more I might make it a more singable melody and I know exactly what that is because I've sung so many melodies that I've played and if I want to do a more pianistic approach so it's more wide interval or what I would think is a pianistic approach or something like that then I know it's going to be kind of an instrumental sound and not a more vocal melody sound. Also, I'm not saying to just sing along with like whatever the latest Adele song is. Obviously, that's super hard and she's a wonderful singer. So you might go, ah, I don't want to sound like a loser in comparison or whatever. So by all means, start with Bob Dylan, start with Tom Waits, start with someone who just sings one note a lot or within like a, a fifth register or something like that. It'll be much, much, much easier. Next up would be scales and chords. A lot of students have come to me going like, yeah, I know all my chords. And they play, I go play C or something like that. They go, okay. Maybe those three, but they know licks like this. And I'm like, well, that's also C. They might know. That's also C, even though I'm not hitting that, they might go. That's also C. You know, there's so many different kinds of C to be seed, <laughs> to be seen. <laughs> uh, and it's really helpful to try to, you know, pick a chord, I don't know, every week, pick a scale every month, and really work it out all over the neck. How many different ways can you play C all over the neck? You have seven days. It's just C major, not C minor, not C7, not C major 7 just C triad, you know, and then pick C minor triad or C minor seven or whatever the next week. And so the same thing goes with scales, learning one scale a month, give yourself a bit more time because there's a lot of different patterns. But a lot of students of mine will come to me and they know this scale. Right, but they'll know certain licks like, realize that that's coming from or or when you start learning all the scales in all the different areas generally with the cage system it's pretty helpful and it's pretty simple um, but you could do it the you know kind of finger stretch way or just kind of highlight all the notes and get from one octave to another plenty of ways to go about it Easiest way would though be the caged way. Uh, you start to realize, oh, a lot of my, you know, licks, a lot of my riffs, whatever, are built off of these. I'm just like adding other notes. So when I do, um, say, I'm doing something in C, and I'm doing this, right? Like I was doing with the chords. I now know that I'm going up major pentatonic. And if I wanted to, I'm just two notes away from a major scale and I end up with these kinds of licks. Right? It's sort of a lick, it's sort of playing chords. It's like that wonderful in-between that we like to hear, that we love, you know, people like Hendrix did all the time. Last up is technique, which is like sort of covered in all the other things, but you know, here would be a focus. Now, there's about a million things on the internet involving like how to play fast or how to teach you all the things or how to sweep or whatever. And 
you know, doing a scale in thirds is doing the scale in thirds no matter what book you read it from. So I just kind of recommend the ones that I grew up with, which would be ones that my heroes made and other heroes of mine and contemporaries actually got a lot from. So that would be John Petrucci's Rock Discipline and Steve Vai's like 30 hour a week or whatever it was, guitar workout. Steve Vai had that one where it was like, you would basically find some photocopy someone did in like 1992 or something like that of the 30 hour a week guitar thing. And then some years back, I think he made it into like a Mel Bay or Hal Leonard or whatever uh, actual book. And that thing is super helpful. Same with the Petrucci Rock Discipline. You can find it on YouTube, but I would recommend just getting it because even though it might come with a DVD, hopefully it comes with a just, you know, streamable thing at this point. But you can see the whole thing. You can see him play exactly what is on the tab, and that is huge. Seeing it playing slow, or slow-ish, seeing it played slow and fast, seeing it with certain tone, with certain inflection, and then seeing it on the page really helps tie a lot of things together. And both examples are exhaustive. Petrucci has the, it's a very long, uh, he goes super in depth to things that like aren't of use to me, but I'm glad that I did, you know, like these big, I don't know, different exercises that just kind of help with hand flexibility, help with uh, kind of showing your hand what's possible. Like I remember when I started playing and uh, the Stairway to Heaven intro, right? Watch me get copyright claim on this for this. Let me just hold the chords so I don't. <laughs> right? That third chord, that was super hard to me when I started playing. And, you know, focusing on all these different stretches, all these different technique things, this is nothing now. You know, now if it was like... Granted, I could be holding the guitar up here, but then it would be really easy. But, uh, you know, you, you can work on flexibility and strength uh, with a lot of his, well, both of their um, technique workouts or whatever booklets. And lastly is community. And for that, I would say, see above, <laughs> see the jams, you know, go to jams. You will meet plenty of people. Everyone will like you. It'll be fine. And also, you know, obviously message boards and, you know, this platform, Instagram, blah, 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 all the different social media things, just comment, make yourself known. You know, there's the people who just watch, which is fine. But if you comment, you know, you can get to know people quite a bit. You know, everyone likes nice people. If you're just nice and friendly and, you know, communicative, people will be generally nice, friendly, and communicative back. And it's a really big thing that I always mention to students is like, especially if they're like the only one of their friends who play guitar or something like that, community is really what helps you keep going. It really helps you, you know, keep excited about it. Even your friends are like, hey, have you seen something, something? You're like, oh, I didn't even think about that. You know, it's part of your life now. It's not this hobby that you and you alone have. It's this hobby that you and your community has. So there's the general outline of the parting advice, parting thoughts that I like to give my students as we reach our final lesson. It really is aimed at like, you know, hitting fundamentals, hitting essentials, and being able to go like, okay, if you teach yourself, but you just write this down and kind of revisit it from time to time, you'll be fine. So I hope this helps you. I hope this gives some direction, some goals, maybe shed some light on some areas to work on, and I hope you get a lot out of it. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you all next week.